Hello! Welcome to Killer Score, the podcast that covers cult classic movies with phenomenal soundtracks that we believe deserve more attention and their composers, directors, and everything in between. So, we are in the final stretch of the Spooky Season episode, and I'm bringing it on home this time with a very interesting film. Uh, but first, let's get into the introductions. I, of course, am Dalton Morrison. You can find me on line at youtube and twitter at sick jacket man uh got some projects in the work that are coming out soon and i'm gonna pass it on down the line hi the now less congested aaron murray (laughs) (laughs) if you saw last week's episode you know what that means um you can find me at witchandcraftsnj.com etsy.com slash witchandcrafts.nj sorry witchandcraftsnj there's no dot in there uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that all fun stuff. Richard Eckert, Richard's Rad Voices, and friends from Tantalus Productions. Working on all sorts of comic dubs and other stuff, but I'd like to actually announce something uh, that is confirmed, that I have recently got the part of Josh Lotor on Frog Raccoon Strawberry. Tune into that little web cartoon and watch me do all sorts of pitiful, ugly crying and emo singing. Why did this happen to me? Hey, try not to get us a copyright strike. Sorry. (laughs) Same energy. Anyway, uh, we are bringing it home with Spooky Season and, uh, Mr. Morrison has a treat for us. That I do. So, we haven't really covered any films that I would call, like, 100%, like, surreal on the show before. Would you guys agree? I mean, Eternal Sunshine is somewhat surreal, but not in the way that this film is. Yeah. It's more surreal in the showing you how the process works sort of way. Mm Mm-hmm. So, this one was directed by a guy known as... Uh, so this was... Yeah, the first... This was actually, like, the feature film directing of Nobuhiko Obayashi. He He wrote the script for the film, and he actually wasn't even the first choice. This was distributed through Toho, and Toho, of course, is, like, one of the biggest film studios in Japan... And at the time, uh, they had noticed this film came into creation around 1976 is when they came out with, like, the idea of, like, you know, releasing it. Because Jaws had come out, and when it came out in Japan, it was also a big hit, just like it was everywhere else. And Toho was like, you know what? We probably need, like, a horror film. I mean, we have Godzilla, but that's become more of a kid's franchise now. It's gone downhill in, like, returns. This was the time when Toho actually, like, Shortly after, like, 75-ish, they actually put the uh, halt on Godzilla for about 10 years almost, because Godzilla didn't come back till 84. Wasn't this around the Jet Jaguar era of Godzilla? Yeah, this was the late Showbuy era Godzilla, so that's when it got really campy, kitty-friendly, you know, Godzilla fighting giant, like, lobsters and stuff mm. like that. I mean, it's fun, but it oh, is... Oh, no, it's fun. It's it fun. is definitively... Uh, commercialized though I mean towards the end of the show wire is when we got the debut of Mecha Godzilla who's iconic Godzilla villain so it's not yeah. all bad yeah that's true but robots. there was a uh, guy who worked in the industry Obayashi who mostly did commercial work and short film work at the time and Toho commissioned him he didn't work for Toho and they said hey you were looking at interest with this. Can you make a film for us? Like, a, can you write a script for us? And he was like, sure. And weirdly enough, he chose a more surrealist horror idea. And he actually went to his teen, preteen daughter, Chigumi, and went, hey, can you uh, give me some ideas of stuff that worries you and scares you? And she did, because his idea was, well, if kids kids can come up with stuff that we would never think of because our brains would just 
be way too logical to think of certain fears. Kind of sounds like a Japanese Dr. Seuss in that regard. Yeah, almost. And this film is incredibly surreal. It's all about the surrealism of the setting, the scenes, the characters. Every character is an archetype, and that's it. They are literally named after what archetype they are. Looking at the cast already, and it's hilarious. Yeah, their names are literally their personality and archetype. The smart one. Professor, the pretty one, gorgeous, the one who spends too much time daydreaming, fantasy. The one who eats too much, McDonald's. No, just Mac. Oh, just Mac? Yeah, you don't want to get sued. Fair enough. <laughs> so, two copyright jokes in one, in just a couple of minutes span. This does not bode well for us. No. Nope. And before the, as the script was turned in, uh, they, like, started with other pre-production work uh the main composer of this this film actually has two composers so it was composed by Asai Kobayashi and Miki Yoshino uh Kobayashi was well known before this for being a tv composer mostly for scores for a lot of action and kid oriented shows he did the score for Gatchaman, Turn A Gundam, Beast King Go Lion and even Tayo Sentai Sun Vulcan. That is a lot of seminal anime classics there. Yeah, so very experienced composer. And he was the one who suggested to Obayashi that they should bring in Miki Yoshino. Miki Yoshino was actually uh, kind of underground at the point. He was heading the rock band go to go who were very obscure at the time, but would actually blow up around the same time that house released because they did the theme for uh, the theme song Monkey Magic for a show called Sayuki, which is also known as Monkey in International Territories. It was a live action retelling of Journey to the West. Uh, very famously, you know, that show actually had a big cult following in the UK. Oh, yeah. I think oh. it had that really elaborate prosthetic makeup stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the blue screens. Mm -hmm. Um I've seen bits and pieces of that show. It's actually pretty fun. Yeah, and it's uh, it's credited for bringing a lot more interest in the Journey in the West fable back into Japan. So one could argue that might have helped lead into Dragon Ball if you want to, like, really big brain things. Yeah. Then um, after that, Yoshino continued to compose for a lot of projects even after go to go ended. He composed for the live-action anime, uh, the live-action adaptation of the anime Peacock King. And the incredibly popular, he also did the score for an incredibly popular 2014 comedy film called Swing Girls that did incredibly well in Japan. Hmm. He even went on a year later to win the Japan Academy Prize for his music in 2005, was in countless other bands aside from Go To Go, and even wrote a book and co-wrote another all about the composing experiences. So, this film is one of the few examples I can think of where we were uh, stuck with what you'd like to call pre-production hell. Um, Development hell, if you will. Yeah. So, they got the score together, they got everything together, and it was submitted to Toho. But Toho hated this movie's script. They said it made no sense. They gave it to a bunch of directors. Every director who touched the script went, what is this? I'm not directing this. This will end my career. And because of that, they only actually were able to get a bunch of independent people doing it. Um, it sat for two years, but Obayashi got newfound popularity in that time with college students from a short film Emotion that blew up. He then used his popularity to essentially almost like guilt trip or blackmail or even trick Toho into letting him promote the film <laughs> and using this marketing campaign. He basically wore down Toho into making him direct the film because they oh just my... wanted to get it out. Oh my God, he twisted their arm. Yeah. Yep. And there was a lot of promotion leading up to it. Uh, the soundtrack was released before the film was even out. And there was a, a manga and a radio drama tie-in to the film. Huh. Um, Speaking of tie-ins, 
I'm looking at his filmography, and apparently he also... Oh, yeah, he, he directed, ends he up di- directing a lot of adaptations later. Case in point, The Girl Who Left Through Time, which is probably more famous for its anime film adaptation. Yeah, he even ended up doing a uh, really um, critically acclaimed uh, f- biopic about the life of Sada Abe, uh, who was a like famous prostitute hmm. in Japan. And Obayashi became a steadily employed director after this film because when it came out, it was billed with a double feature because, like, Toho had no confidence in this movie. They put it with a double feature romance film called Pure Hearts in the Mud. And shockingly, the college audiences that Obayashi had brought in went to this film and they made it into a cult phenomenon. And it did really well in the box office because of that. It was a sleeper hit. And Obayashi even worked a little more with Toho later. He submitted his own script for a Godzilla movie called A Space Godzilla, which was rejected for being too weird. What? Okay, okay. I I need to take an aside for this. I'm gonna let you finish. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sorry. If Moonraker can't exist. (laughs) If Moonraker, not only that, too weird for Godzilla, need I remind you, this was... Around the same time as... As Godzilla fighting pollution, yes. <laughs> as pollution, as Jet Jaguar, as uh, Megalon, I believe. Well, let me put it this way. this th- His Godzilla script was as surreal as this film is, if not more so. Like, it was almost like a metatextual examination of Godzilla. All right, then. I would have watched it. Yeah, no, uh, if you want, the scripts are out there online. There was a Godzilla magazine that included a bunch of his drafts and ideas for the film. So look it up if you're intrigued. And before you ask, wait, did they take that and turn it into Space Godzilla? Turns out that's just a coincidence. He actually came up with the name Space Godzilla before Space Godzilla even existed. Argue. So someone stole the name. Yeah, kind of. Arguably one of the better late-stage Godzilla movies. That was fun. I liked it. Yeah, and this film didn't even blow up in cult circles overseas until 2009 and 2010. John has picked up the international distribution rights and started doing screenings in which it became a cult hit. Um, Once the film actually got into production, though, everything went pretty smoothly. No one in Toho cared about the movie, so they were really hands-off. Obayashi brought in a bunch of, like, models and actresses he had worked with in commercials before, for the sake of familiarity, and even brought in a popular country singer he was friends with, Kiyohoko, uh, Kiyohoko Ozaki, who ends up playing the character Mr. Togo, or some of his family and friends played background characters in the movie. His daughter, Chigumi, even, who gave a lot of the ideas, even plays the little girl in one scene in the film. Uh, seems like the typical uh, indie director approach and from what you're telling me this is one of those moments where cast associates thing, where the whole cast associates thing <laughs> bless you worked out in favor of house <laughs> bless you again sorry yeah, it's okay she, she did say less congested but it's not all the way yeah uh no October. So, even though this film is very surreal, it brings up some pretty deep stuff. Part of the script has to deal with the after effects of the generation and the people who were left behind after some of the atomic bombings. That's part of the plot of the film. And, like I said, mostly amateurs uh, in this, with the exception of Kimiko Ikigami and Yoko Minamita, who were experienced actresses at that point. They also went on to have a really good time actually while making the movie um toa was hands off they had ample room to mess around there was even a bit where uh the actress kimiko ikigami was uncomfortable with a with a nude scene and fellow actress yoko minamita helped her feel more comfortable by getting nude herself and yeah and that actually led obayashi to going oh well do you want to have a nude scene in the film as well and Minamito was like, yeah, sure, sounds good. And 
a lot of them were inexperienced, which did have one difficulty, which was they were having trouble acting in general for a while. And to his credit, Obayashi didn't blow up and came up with a really interesting technique. He used the soundtrack, which keep in mind had already been made, and played it in the background of scenes with the matching score so that the girls would get the tone. Like a dungeon master. Yeah, yeah. honestly. And to keep with the childish, uh, the childish and surreal nature of the film, the effects are deliberately childish and unrealistic looking. They even messed around with chroma key in some scenes, despite being completely unaware what would happen to the scene, just because they were curious to see what would happen and how it would turn out. That is so chaotic. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what happens. It's like a, a weird, kind of bizarro world, Jacob's Ladder, which, one second. Why didn't I pick that to cover this year? <laughs> Too late. And so... Stupid! And so... Uh, they pulled in a bunch of favors. They brought in a bunch of friends and family. It was a close-knit, chill cast. All the members of go to go actually even make a cameo in the movie before the girls set off on a uh, train ride across country. Oh. The members of go to go are, like, flirting with the girls at the train station. First off, bless you again. Or was that, that just was a cough? cough? Anyway. Um, second off, I... I went in as blind as possible for this one because uh, I've heard I've heard things, mostly from Dalton here. Yep. So before we get into the screening, we will give you the plot synopsis. Who wants to read the plot synopsis for this one? I did it last time. I would say I've already seen this movie. Oh, okay, I'll do it then. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sure. Two or two if you wanna, if you wanna read the plot synopsis for us. <clears throat> How to describe Nobuhiko Obayashi's indescribable 1977 movie House. As a psychedelic ghost tale, a stream of consciousness bedtime story, an episode of Scooby-Doo as directed by Mario Bava. Very apt description, honestly. <laughs> Any of the above will do this for hallucinate do for this hallucinate Tori head trip about a schoolgirl who travels with six classmates to her ailing aunt's creaky country home and comes face to face with evil spirits, a demonic house cat, a bloodthirsty piano, and other ghoulish visions, all realized by Obayashi via Matt's animation and collage effects. Equally absurd and nightmarish, house might not have beamed to earth Er, ah. House might have been beamed up to Earth from some other, other planet, never before available on home video in the United States. It's one of the most exciting cult discoveries in years. And an apt entry in the Criterion Collection's library. Yeah, it's very well suiting and fitting. This is definitely one of those times where this was one of the most... When this came out, this was one of the most anticipated releases for Criterion mm -hmm. because it had been blowing up in the indie film circles for cult classic films since the Jana screenings. Nice. Uh, one of those things that uh, circulated fan sub circles, I imagine. Well, not even because this came out like right after the Jana screenings. Like, Jana immediately got in contact with their Criterion huh. people. It came out in 2010, the same year that like the initial like the second wave of screenings were going huh. Jonas really wanted to get this out and as I said before I went in as blind as possible because Dalton told me that this was something you need to go in with zero expectations about yes because I've seen this movie before and I remember the first time I wa Dalton and I watched it together but I remember watching it and half the time going what the fuck is going on but in, like, a fun way. But in a fun way, yeah. This movie, like, I don't care who you are. If you haven't seen this movie before, it's going to surprise you at least once. Sounds like if Wet Hot American Summer were a horror movie instead of a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not too wrong. All right, so let's get into screening Nobuhiko Obayashi's House.
So, we just got done watching Obayashi's surreal masterpiece horror fiction genre kind of roulette film. You know, you got elements of, like, fantasy, comedy, horror, even, like, musical elements, because, like, music's a huge part of the film, and it's almost a pseudo-musical, because there's certain scenes that just have no dialogue and just music, and one of the main characters is played by a country singer. Well, there's a bunch of musicians in here. The watermelon salesman is played by one of the film's composers, Asai Kobayashi. And the hippies at the train station that flirted with the, the girls are the members of Go. So, uh, yeah, this is my first time seeing this in, uh, like, a couple years or so. And yeah, about a year or two. Yeah, about a year or two. And, yeah, it's just as weird and fun as it was the first time. Mm-hmm. Um. We'll get more into the themes and all that jazz later, but uh, yeah, I want to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Uh, I'll hand it over to to uh, Rich because it's his first time watching it. Takashi Miike's progenitors were weird. <laughs> so, as predicted, I am very much in a similar t- position to Wenton. I was introduced the likes of Wet Hot American Summer by Dalton and Aaron. Episode Uh, one! uh, I feel like I'm a bit out of my depth talking about House. Uh, Fair warning, it is good. It it is very good. I, I have nothing but praise to heap upon this movie for its cinematography for some of its visual experimentation for its score oh especially its score but chances are if you are a first timer like me this movie is probably going to make you insufferable to talk to for hours on end as you insist on going point by point and repeating yourself that you are not making everything oh, up yeah. about this movie. <laughs> and insisting your friends that this isn't just a Mad Libs paper that you're trying to convince was a movie. I- exactly. Yeah. Uh, but while I collect my thoughts... Blank girls, uh, seven girls, go to a... Noun? No. House in the country. <laughs> after they're led there by a cat... <laughs> <laughs> By animal, cat. Yeah. (laughs) So while I'm collecting my thoughts as to how I can put this nightmarish masterpiece and my thoughts on it thereof into words, how about we have someone who has seen it collect her thoughts? So I don't really have thoughts to collect because this is my second time seeing this movie. No thoughts, head empty. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) You know the meme. You know the meme. Um, I thought this movie was an, I don't want to use the term oddball movie, because it's not that kind of, because oddball doesn't fit it, but it's very surreal and strange. Experimental. Experimental, I think, is the word that we're going for. Um. Nightmarish. Nightmarish, One yeah. I argue it's an art house movie, to be honest. I would put it in the art house category. Yeah. I mean, it's on... It's on Criterion, for God's sake. Yeah. Like, Art House is kind of the name of the game. I mean, given... The people who fell in love with this movie initially, because critics in Japan hated this movie when it came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It did well commercially, but its main audience was like, you know, hip college kids in the late 70s. Yeah, it's our House movie. Yeah. There's yeah. The, there's its college audience and the fact that it's sharing a streaming service with the works of Jim Jarmish. Let's not forget that this was the generation that made porn mainstream. Yep. Yep. Look at Deep Throat. Actually, don't. There's a, there's a history to it. There are layers. Yeah, or Debbie Does Dallas. Any of the big porn flicks that became, like, huge... Successes, mainstream movies. mainstream movies that actually had to be talked about. I will be omitting images from the YouTube version, probably. Yeah, we don't want to get demonetized. Yeah. Just use, just use like safe for work box art of the movies or something, so people. There, it exists. It, it exists. exists. They exist. So, 
I think the biggest thing to talk about with this movie is, ironically, trauma. Because trauma plays a big part in the film. Uh, which leads into its art house elements. One could argue that much like uh, Grave of the Fireflies, this film's message is about how younger generations don't understand the plight of those who survived war. Who survived World War Two. Case in point, Gorgeous and her relationship with her father. Yeah, or just intergenerational conflict in general. Uh, I think what best demonstrates the flippant attitude towards this sort of like thing is in a scene that's very ahead of its time gorgeous is essentially telling the backstory of her aunt whose husband who's like husband to be died during the war, world war II. during world war ii and she's never given up the hope that he'll come back and it's shown in a flashback sequence that shot very tastefully like an old black and white film of the era yeah, complete with film strip effects like it's starting to burn. Yeah, and what I say makes it ahead of its time is the fact that the girls are kind of riffing what it, it like it's a film in-universe they're seeing. It's like a home movie. Yeah. The closest thing I can think of is when we watched Amelie and they had all those like interjecting, like, interjecting clips throughout the film mm-hmm. of like the theater the theater of the mind kind of thing going yeah. on and the film is just generally about generational trauma as well gorgeous is big conflict and the whole reason the plot of the film kicks off is she decides to visit her aunt because she wants to become closer to the memory of her departed mother who died about eight years ago during the film mm-hmm. and her the only surviving relative she knows of of her mother is her aunt who lives out in the countryside in Karazawa. Mm-hmm. So she decides to take her friends during vacation, during their like school break, during vacation to go visit them. Yeah. After they're led there and given the idea by a strange white cat that shows up at the house, uh, that shows up at Gorgeous's house, which leads into the plot more than you know. Because once again generational trauma gorgeous has conflict with her father because her father has Has met someone and is going to be remarrying which kicks off everything because ryoko wants to connect to her mother before she loses the memory of her you can imagine ryoko is the mom is the dad i didn't say ryoko yet yeah you did oh gorgeous wants to connect with um the memory of her mother before ryoko almost like in her mind at least replaces her yeah. And the film follows uh, her processing these emotions, meeting her aunt, and talks a lot about trauma. And it almost seems to be negating the idea that one necessarily has to understand the trauma of an older generation. And even if one doesn't understand the suffering and trauma of an older generation, that doesn't mean that the older generation should lash out and attack the younger. Which I kind of understand, which on a on a personal note, it's like talking to your grandparents and they're telling you about like everything they went through in like World War Two and the Great Depression and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And when you're young, you don't really understand it. But when you get older, it's like now I understand why my grandparents did the things they did because they survived these things. There's a... Now that you mention it, I'm getting similar themes from this movie that about generational disconnect and the Mm -hmm. dynamics of trauma from uh, i'm getting similar vibes from this movie that i did from strangely enough mouse when i when i read that for the first time because um one common complaint that that book got was that it focused a bit too much on art spiegelman and that he kind of portrayed his dad as a whiner when that whole dynamic was kind of the point and Art was discovering stuff about his father in real time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not going to go into the full details now because Mouse is uh, an impossibly layered work of graphic novel fiction. Well, historical like nonfiction that I 
couldn't possibly hope to meaningfully tackle myself in uh, that small time slice, but there's similar themes going on here in the ways that Dalton had mentioned. Yeah, and another thing I want to bring up is uh, a question that I want to posit to you guys. So, in the film, they mentioned that the house itself used to be a hospital as well Mm -hmm. to take care of, like, patients during the war, which brought something into my head. Do you guys think that this is just, like, pure witch stuff, like it's an evil witch doing all this, the cat doing it, or do you think the house itself? which is possessed by the rageful spirits of those affected by the war is what's causing all this and perhaps even like possessing the ant. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Like maybe the house itself is a conduit mm. for that all makes the... those feelings worse. Yes. Yeah. It's like the house is a conduit or an arcane focus for that uh, D&D terms. Um, <laughs> uh, or a focus for her weird trauma trauma powers. The cat is her familiar and her harbinger. Like, you know, like the famous black dog. Yeah. In, yeah. Uh, folklore. Folklore. Definitely. Yeah. I would say it's probably mostly the house, but also the cat does have something to do with it because the cat, in my opinion, is probably... Like an evil spirit, an evil spirit form taking cat. form of a cat. It's yeah, a like a vengeful, a vengeful spirit. Yeah, it's like a grim. Aaron. It's like a grim. Maybe even it's like a cat that died during the war. Maybe. You know? oh. But my idea is the closest thing I can think of to something like this is when you go to like a historic location. Where, like, you know, a lot of people died. Like, when I drove through Gettysburg National Park. Oh, uh, and you can feel, like, the heaviness. And you can feel all the heaviness and, like, everything that, like, happened there almost. Mm. Where you can just, like, feel the weight of everything. Like, of the atrocities. Yeah. Of the yeah. atrocities of everything that happened there. Because, like, I've driven Route 30 in Pennsylvania. It goes right through Gettysburg National Park. Um, which, if you're outside the U.S., was one of the biggest battles in the American Civil War. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to go into a history lesson. All I'm saying is that the weight of being in a location like that, you can feel the energy and, like, the heaviness of everything that's happened there. Like, obviously, you haven't experienced it yourself, because this happened, like, what, 160 years ago? Yeah. Um, but... In my opinion, houses have, or just locations in general, can hold, like, the energy of things that have happened there. I know it probably sounds crazy to some of our viewers. Um, but in my opinion, this is just my opinion, roast me if you want. (laughs) (laughs) Um, when something bad happens in a place, there's still that residual, like, feeling of something bad happened here. And I feel like that's how the house is. I, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I don't have much to add to that, really. That's insightful. And I mean, it's about the closest thing you could probably get to an explanation in a movie where the house is... Like is evil e- Scooby-Doo. Yeah. 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 R-rated Scooby-Doo yeah. to the max. Uh, do we want... How do you even mark spoilers for this thing? We'll, because, we'll get into it, because I feel again, like we can still yeah, we talk can still about go. non-spoiler but, stuff. Again, I'm, if I'm quieter, I apologize. It's just that I'm... You want to talk about the insane like, parts. I get it. My soul kind of left my body <laughs> in the midst of this second... Part. You ever have that feeling, guys? Yeah. Where, yeah. like, I was here, I was not present. Uh, yeah. Like, just white noise, like, as my head, <laughs> as my soul just sort of floated around the studio. You had an out-of-body experience while watching this. <laughs> while watching this and comprehending, like... What the fuck am I watching? That this stupid movie is deeper than it seems. Like, 
I had, yeah, I had such a profound, like, we are talking about post-war trauma and generational drift in this movie with witch cats and killer furniture. And angry watermelon mans yes. that constantly yell every back single to the line. themes, please. Please, let's get back. You know, speaking of uh, foreignness, because that's like a part of like just discussing this in general the film actually i forgot to bring up it was mi named house because in the 70s naming your film in japan after an english title was kind of taboo huh. yeah it was kind of a punk thing to do like a bold defiance of nationalistic mm -hmm. uh over overtones yeah because a lot of those filmmakers and creators who were create churning out propaganda during the 40s for the japanese audience were still alive and in high positions of the japanese film board yeah um even after the war ended there was still very much the undercurrent of japanese nationalism and that... even the suggestion that you shouldn't talk about certain things and you should more focus on like this, which is why Godzilla itself was so controversial when it first came out, because th it, this was only nine years, not even a full ten years, only yep. nine years after the bombings. And this was a film talking about nuclear power and disaster and a being that itself was nuclear rage embodied. It is always so amazing to me to see people's reactions to the very first, you know, original Godzilla, because it is a bleak. It movie. is dark. It, is. it, it really is, is dark. It is not pulling its punches. It, like it, it is so far removed from the kaiju punch em ups of the other movies that it is insane. It's great, but it's. You don't go in for a mood lifter. Mm. No, because I remember when Dalton and I were... Uh, when I first watched the original Godzilla, there was this one scene that was just, like, so heart-wrenching when the city's being destroyed. <sighs> yeah. And the mother is just holding her children, saying, mm -hmm. we're going to see Daddy. Yeah. Hell, even Godzilla's roar in the original, it's not... It's not awe-inspiring. It's nightmare. Agonizing, almost. It, it's yeah. pain. It sounds painful. It, It's like... I feel like if you could translate that roar, it would be screaming, Why? End this madness now! Kill me! Why, Black Dynamite? Why? <laughs> God damn it, Aaron! Bokoso! <laughs> Some cartoon shit like that. House. 1977's House. Go watch our Black Dynamite review. It's a lovely film. Go watch Black Dynamite. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Just watch the movie. Just go watch Black Dynamite. We want more people to see it. In my opinion, one of the finest parody films ever created. House. House. Back to house. So, uh. one. let's get more into the technical elements of this movie. Ooh, because yes. Yes. much like Highlander, weirdly enough, this is one of those films where you can see the touches of the former commercial director who made it and the music video director it has a lot of yeah. those flourishes which is astonishing considering that this film predated music videos being yeah. like super popular well another thing i wanted to mention is that we know here in the west we know music videos getting super popular through like mtv and that kind of thing in the 80s yeah but even overseas music videos didn't really blow up blow up until the 80s yeah i was actually i remember this this is this is gonna be a throwback to anyone who is um aware in 2012 uh i listened to a podcast on the making of gangnam style and how <laughs> every single popular song in South Korea also came with a music video and this went back decades every one like it was a popular song. Yeah, there, it was. Really it had a music video. Oh my god! Because of the because of the biggest the big influence of like K-pop and same thing goes in Japan and you know? commercialism in Japan and Korea. Um. But anyway, sorry. Um. I stole the microphone for to mention Gangnam Style. I apologize. 
Wouldn't well, have it well, any now, other way. It, for the record, though, I have to state how much, I how much hatred I have for the unbridled chaos that is Aaron Murray's existence. Because now I know for a fact that I need to. Put a gift to whatever the flying fuck that was, that was right even there. Style. Yeah, that was. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Killer Score where we break Richie's and brain in half. I can't breathe. So it even uses a lot of techniques that you'll see. In music videos in the future, lots of crossfades, Gaussian blurs and stuff. Yeah, things like soft focus, weird transition uses, mm-hmm. use, usages. Yeah. And a whole lot of crazy crossfades. Mm-hmm. Um, and chroma key. And chroma key. They mix transitions together. Animation. Animation. And I think my absolute favorite part of the visual element mm-hmm. are those backdrops that one could easily confuse for actual scenery until you take a look and say to yourself, those are paintings. <laughs> yeah. It's but, only a model. <laughs> yeah. But they're gorgeous. Like, I don't know. Not the it, character. chaotic episode of killer score i mean it's kind of appropriate yeah, for a movie for this we're, we're going from uh post-war trauma to gangnam style to puns puns but it's so great um i don't know how he did it but he you know, the madman the madman pulled, pulled it off he made watercolors and stuff look like genuine sunsets it, yeah. and it's played out to perfection and uh the how childish and deliberately flawed the effects are in this movie makes it work so well really adds to that child's nightmare atmosphere yeah and the surrealist elements and i think one other thing we all want to bring up because we were all like praising it during the movie and i'm sure that uh, our resident lighting nerd Richie will dork out over this. The lighting of the film. Care to talk about it, Rich? Sure do. Um, as we have went over before, Chroma Key does play a huge role in the uh, atmosphere of this movie. Oh, yeah. But one thing that truly... One thing that makes House the master of of tone that it is is just how much it plays with blaring almost Dario Argento style lighting especially in the second half of the movie where things get crazy and there are a whole bunch of indoor horror shots of what goes on in the house um I think my personal favorite thing about this film is its use of backlighting. Um, There are so many moments where characters are ensnared in the curse of this house and the spell that follows, and you get all sorts of strobe lighting effects and uh, backlighting, almost as if, once again, it were a music video without the music and and sometimes with the music and yeah and sometimes with the music but uh that's a discussion for spoilers i'd say um like i said i i've mentioned dario argento but uh as dalton had said i wouldn't be surprised if wes craven took some lighting tricks from i would be because as right. I explained to you multiple times during the screening, this film did not release outside of Japan until 2009. We have been spoiled rotten by how easily accessible foreign films are nowadays, yeah. to be honest. Oh, yeah. we're, we're living in a good time for that, yeah. if absolutely nothing else. But um, 
You can, you can even get a bit of Evil Dead out of this movie with the house itself attacking people. Oh yeah, and like I said, when I when I mentioned the furniture, I meant it. Yeah. Same sort of anything can happen. Uh, mentality applies. Um, one In thing, some scenes, it almost seems like the house itself is like laughing with the furniture, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I think what makes the horror element work so well is how the... It feels like a nightmare. It feels like a nightmare, especially in how... It's, disconnected everything. Is. Everything's disconnected, and it sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll be in the middle of a calm, comparatively grounded scene. I say comparatively because the whole film is fucking bonkers, even when it's just focusing on the slice of life stuff the early water, on. And the bathwater will just be blood, and it won't be addressed or even focused on, you know? You'll just see body parts somewhere. Yeah. Like, somewhere in the mix, almost sublim subliminally, just like, there it is. And I remember kind of having that aforementioned out-of-body experience when suddenly, scary image, I'm... I'm like, what the shit? <laughs> Look, ah, no. And I just really want to praise a few things. One is Kobayashi's uh, acting. For a guy who was a TV composer, he does a pretty good job of acting the as the dude. watermelon salesman. He's really funny. He's mm -hmm. funny and also a bit unnerving in his oh, own yeah. way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like, ah, he clearly knows something. Like, he... He knows that something's not right with the ant in the house, and he's just, like, trying to be like, yeah, that place is creepy. He Don't even, go there. If you pay attention, he even always refers to the house in English. He always says, house. he always says, house. He never said the romanization, like, mm -hmm. of the actual English of it. You know what he reminds me of? The hitchhiker from... Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm. There's that same sort or of. Or you wonder if he's in on it, you know? Yeah, there's that same sort of harbinger or forebearer of things to come. Mm -hmm. The first sign that things are not grounded. Yeah, and the score itself I would describe uh, as playful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best way to put it. It has, like, that childlike feel to it. That kind of, like, jaunty kind of music box feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where someone's just sort of noodling on a organ or synth. Which makes it all the more creepier when that sort of childlike, whimsical sort of score is underscored to creepy stuff. And gore. And gore. Uh, nothing super graphic, though. It's more artistic gore, if that makes any sense. But if you watch this film, you'll understand what we mean. It is very evocative of the sort of... Uh, of surrealism. Yeah. It's Sur surrealist. It's, it's surrealist. Not, like, slasher movie gore. No. Yeah. No, it's, de it's deliberately unsettling in that it doesn't look realistic, and it's intentional. Unrealistic for sure, but just gruesome enough that the idea of it is enough to unsettle you. Sort of a cinematic uncanny valley. It makes you feel like Obayashi, the director's daughter, Chigumi, having those sort of childish fears and nightmares. Mm -hmm. And it, it very much puts you in her shoes that way, and very effectively so. And the movie can even be, like, just fun with the score when it wants to. Go to Go's original, like, lyrical songs. Like, the uncomfortably comforting uh, final song that plays into the ending. Excellent use of s dissonance in the soundtrack there. Oh, Especially with the lyrics. Or even just the fun, jaunty travel song when the girls are going to the countryside. Or that scene when uh, the ant is in the house and the cat is kind of meowing along to everything. Yeah, they synchronize cat meows to the music, so I was like, meow, 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 meow. <laughs> and no, I'm not doing Welcome to the Black Parade as a cat. It just sounds a lot like Welcome to the Black Parade, oddly enough. It's kind of disconcerting because there would be no way Gerard Way would be 
familiar with this film. Although I wouldn't be surprised if he saw it once it became available. Oh yeah, I wouldn't not be surprised either. The only way I can imagine him ever seeing this film is like if someone brought it, got a DVD copy when they were touring in Japan for like yeah, or three cheers over. or something. Yeah. My point is, um, the score is just excellently done, and I can see why uh, Kobayashi and uh, Yoshino were like heavily hired composers after this and before this as well. They tackle a lot of different sounds, and they do all of them perfectly. So I want to do one little thing before we get into to, uh, to spoilers. Try to make sure that what I'm about to say isn't a spoiler. So before we get into this, I want to ask you guys what your favorite editing cuts to another scene are in this movie, because I know what my favorite is. My favorite is when the one scene where Professor and everyone's freaking out, not knowing what's going on, is interrupted by a man laughing and leaning into the frame, eating noodles, only for that to cut and show that that is just some guy who runs a noodle stand that Togo is at. It cuts to them at the noodle stand. And there's just a bear there. There's just a bear that also works at the noodle stand. It's moving and everything. Yeah, it's moving. It's hand in bowls. And it's just hanging out. It's just there. He's not making this up. No. And they're just sitting down. And, you know, Mr. Mr. Toe goes on his way to the house. That He spends the majority of the movie on his way to the house, getting sidetracked by weird shenanigans and hijinks, traffic. And, you know, he, he had to take a break. It's a long drive from Tokyo to Karazawa. You know, he got stuck in traffic. Hey, you, sometimes you got to stop at a roadside noodle stand that just happens to have a bear working at it and get some ramen. So, uh, do either of you know what your favorite uh, editing cut is? So, my favorite editing cut is... It's, like, middle towards the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. But it's... It's a scene where... It's an editing cut where you see Blanche the cat. Mm-hmm. And then it... And then it, like, fades and cuts into the painting of the cat on the wall. Oh. Because you just see, like, a normal-looking fluffy white cat, and then you just see the cat on the wall that looks all creepy and stuff. That's the shot they used in the posters. Yeah. Yeah. That is probably my second favorite cut. Uh, The first favorite cut would probably have to be... Uh, I'm trying not to spoil it, okay. um, but it it involves kung fu and some of the transitions between serene shots of gorgeous and her kicking the shit out of the malevolent possessed furniture. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. uh, I I would also say another runner up for me is uh, the hard cuts in back and out of reality from fantasy imagining like Togo arriving as like a knight in shining armor. Oh, yeah, that's that great. Was fun. There was also there was something kind of Monty Python-ish about yeah, yeah, those yeah. shots. It's it's deliberately funny, you know. And that weird little chintzy organ cover of the William Tell overture. Oh, oh wait, no, was that William Tell? That's no, Wagner. that's Fly of the Valkyries. That's Wagner. Um, Whoops! No, the um, or or in that scene, like how in certain scenes they'll just speed up the dialogue really fast for com- comedic effect, and also to create a weird sense of displacement. Yeah, like in the fantasy sequence where it's like, "Oh, you've come to see me. I love you. Mm-hmm. Let's run away together." And their like the, dialogue is all sped up like chipmunk speed. You know, the end. Yeah, and uh, no, the end. <laughs> so, uh. I think now's a good time to get into spoiler territory. 5330. So, uh, another interesting element that I can think we can talk about to go into spoilers and thematic spoilers, too, is you could argue this film is about how you have to become more than what everyone thinks you are. Because everyone's undoing in this movie is leaning way too deep into Into their archetypes. I see that. Kung Fu dies trying to... Be a big hero. And fight off the house. Mm -hmm. Professor dies because she loses her glasses and... And she's desperate to continue her... Reading of the diary. Her reading of the diary, the consuming of knowledge. 
Mac and her (laughs) Mac dies in search of food and becomes food herself. Yeah. Uh, Sweet is lured in by a cutesy doll that takes her off guard and causes her demise. And she herself is turned into part of the house. She's stuck in the clock. Mm -hmm. And for a movie that relies on comparatively rudimentary effects and visual tricks, it sure does convincingly get across that weird-ass concept of folding people into that house. Yeah, it's supposed to be uncanny and deliberately not look good. You've got Gorgeous, who's done in by her, her like... Vanity. Her like vanity. That. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's possessed by the spirit of the of her aunt in the house itself until they emerge into like one entity. And you can see what happens with Melody because she's like entranced by the piano and then just gets eaten by it. Yeah. Fingers, then the whole body. And once again, uh, Dalton pointed out that uh, chances might have been good that one of the Super Mario 64 developers watch that was movie. was one of the hippie college kids that saw this. And put that killer piano mimic into the haunted house level. Yeah, because I'd argue that music room even kind of looks like the music room from house. Yeah, it does. Uh, what else do we have? We got um, fantasy essentially getting sucked in to her own fantasy of someone saving her mm-hmm. by the house itself. Yeah. And... Speaking of Mac earlier, Mm -hmm. um, when I mentioned how much I love the quickness of the scares Mm -hmm. and how they creep up on you, Mm -hmm. the melon head thing was the moment I was referring to when I said the quickness. Um, Like, they they pull you right in from uh, getting acclimated to the house, all the girls having fun, and then suddenly, Mac's head's on the fucking table. Just, or on the out on a shelf outside and it's unnerving as hell and I remember my mouth being agape for a solid minute just like ah another thing that I wanted to oh (laughs) another thing I wanted to mention is the use of like it's almost a motif of using eyeballs or just, like, eyes oh, throughout yes. the movie. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because you notice when you first see a skeleton, he has one eye. One when they're eating the melon, the, uh, um... It looks like, it there's, looks an like there's an eye in Auntie's mouth. Um, you see eyes in a few other scenes. Uh, like, scenes where Whenever it comes... activates its powers, powers, its, its eyes glow. Eye, yeah. And if you ask me, this is probably me just talking out my ass, but... You see a lot of, not a lot, but there are some yokai in Japanese folklore that are based around eyes in places they shouldn't be. Yep. That's that's not an ass pull. That's actually probably inspiration they pulled from. Yeah. Look at you, Aaron, with the folklore knowledge. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, my my uh, yokai knowledge is uh, cursory at best. So um. And in a way, it's almost like stuff like uh. Juan, where there's like a a, a a yokai, where that has like a there's like a yokai that actually inspired that kind of stuff. You know, like a malevolent spirit possessing a certain area that just has like this killing intent. Yeah. Again, this is a t- tough movie to talk about in my typical analytical frame of reference. This isn't even like Ghost Dog where I've primed myself <laughs> for the themes. I, I'm so sorry. I feel like an idiot. No, it's okay. This movie throws you off. I think the yeah. only reason why why Aaron and I are doing so well at this is we've because already we've seen, seen the it film. Before. <laughs> and now we have time to simmer and stew it in our minds. Um, you know, uh, it, I guess just going into the stuff earlier, do you guys have like a favorite... Uh, do you guys have like a favorite... Um, bit of music in the movie easily the music room scene bar none Mm. um runner up for me is the ending sequence with the uh music video but 
Um, Melody's death is just so unnerving because I'll be honest, I was kind of sucked into the the spell. The, itself, the spell yeah. too. Like the music is pretty just like calming and harmonious the and way then, it becomes slowly dissonant too like the keys start being played wrong yeah, yeah like someone just sort of s- slamming their fingers onto uh or just hitting the wrong notes hitting the or wrong note and yeah. you're just like oh that's not right and it yeah. makes the moment where melody loses her fingers and then her hand all the more shocking yeah, because then the piano just goes crazy. And just eats her whole with uh, chroma key being used for oh, the pulls blood. Pulls the blood. It's really interesting. Personally, for me, I think my favorite bit of music, I really like the, the, the go-to-go like traveling music that they do during that scene where they're showing off all the surreal animation as they're traveling through the countryside. Oh, yeah. It's just chill, like, 70s, like, you know, like, kind of like, almost Japanese folk or country music like, that's just like oh this is nice yeah, like soft rock yeah basically. stuff yeah. you would throw on on a road trip it's very thematically appropriate and it's just nice music so for me my favorite would be the scene at the beginning where you first hear the theme of the film played on uh gorgeous's mother's music box because oh. mm-hmm. the I thing was never picked, i would have never oh. thought of that off the top of my head because the thing with music boxes is that they have an air of, like, both something... Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Yeah, they have an air of nostalgia to them. Because although music boxes are still heavily in production, it's and uh, it's mostly a thing of the past. Yeah, it's always associated it's with always the past. It's always associated childhood. with the past. And uh, childhood, yeah. because... Memories. Yeah. Memories. Like, another personal story. My mom's music box, for example, mm-hmm. which is a jewelry box. You'd pull the bottom drawer out and play a song for you, and I would pretend to do ballet to it when I was, like, five. <laughs> but anyway, too many personal stories. Anyway, um, for me, at least, my favorite is a music box for two reasons. One, that sense of nostalgia of, like, that sense of longing that she has to ke- reconnect with her mother, who has been gone for eight years. Yeah. And the other reason is that the tune to it is haunting. And it sets and it's a, up, it's the first instance of the lay motif we're going to see through. It's like setting up the lay motif we're going to be hearing throughout the movie. Yes, and also in the way that it sounds haunting and just slightly off kilter, you know something dark is going to happen. Yeah, there's always like a slight pause in between the notes. Yeah. You know what it, this got me thinking of, and it's... Awesome that you two brought up how music boxes fill a nostalgic sonic hole in people's hearts. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's telling that there's a track on the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack that is a music box. It plays yeah. during the first. It it plays during the first flashbacks to Spike Spiegel's past. Oh yeah. And do you want to know what that track is called? What? Memory. Oh. oh yeah, yeah. So- like. It's telling that it's telling just how universal the music box is as a signifier of memories, both innocent, melancholy, and in the case of House, unnerving. So, uh, another final one I think we can do before we get out of spoiler territories, give our thoughts, unless you guys have a lot more spoiler stuff you want to talk about. Um, I kind of want people to see this. Yeah, same. Same. I mean, it's available. So. It's available. You can stream it on. It's it should still be on HBO. HBO Max. Might be on the Criterion Channel. Might be on some other streaming services. And you can always just buy it off the Criterion, Criterion website. website. So, uh, last one. Favorite death in the film. Ooh. I know mine because uh, it's just so dumb and I love it so much and. It's literally the most nonsensical one in the entire film. Mr. Togo and the Watermelon Guy. <laughs> so, uh, Togo has just got, he's finally gone to the house. You're like, okay, this is going to be the big Calvary moment. Uh, he gets sidetracked by the Watermelon Guy because he's like, hey, do you know what's what's going on in that house? Like, do you know where this house is? Is that the house? And the Watermelon Guy is just like, hey, do you like watermelons? Nah, I prefer bananas. And that causes the watermelon guy to have such a mental breakdown that, like, something just turns him into a skeleton. 
and it's like because he doesn't show up again no uh once like ryoko comes at the end like it's one of those like uh boomerang effects where uh the setup's there and then a whole bunch of other stuff happens in between and then you come back to mr banana yeah and, and then, then when it comes and like togo freaks out about this obviously and like he just keeps repeating the word banana over and over again and they loop the audio and like him motioning when he says banana and it's just this weird surreal effect and you're like okay maybe he'll still show up and then mm-hmm. no and when ryoko shows up watermelon guy nowhere to be seen the watermelons are just everywhere and in mr togo's car just a pile of bananas with Wearing his, his hat. hat which implies that mr togo was turned into bananas by the magic of the house, the house. itself <laughs> my favorite death is probably a toss-up and i'm glad you were asking about that dalton because i was gonna ask if we could talk about our favorite characters and or favorite character deaths um Kung Fu has a great one because it's both tragic and fitting. Yep. Uh, she just gets pulled down into the ocean of blood that's forming. That professor. No, that was... A... Kung Fu got electrocuted. Oh, yeah, she got electrocuted. And then she gets, like, the top half of her body pulled into the dimension. And then the kicks itself. the cat. And her legs that didn't get pulled out, like, basically kill the cat. Like, I, I'm a sucker you for... You never see the cat again. No, we... Oh, yeah, she kills the cat. Yeah. Um... The cat just falls limp. I'm a sucker for going out with a bang deaths, and it's so fitting for it her. Is. Um, this movie ends in tears, basically, but damn if Kung Fu didn't try. Yeah. Uh, but absolute favorite death is probably Melody for me, just it's, because... It's so memorable. It's so yeah. memorable, and I think it's so emblematic of what makes House work. Yeah, as irrational, a irrational childhood fears. Yes. Yeah. Because it, it feels like a rumor that you would hear in like a little, in like a, an elementary, elementary school. school, like, I heard that piano eats people, you know? And once again, it it yanks your chain. It, it sends you through the whole scene and you start wondering, are my fingers going to come off? <laughs> <laughs> So mine, uh, I have two favorites. Mine is a tie between Melody's death, mm. just because it's so horrifying. You got taste. And Sweet's death, because oh. being suffocated by pillows is a horrible way to go. Especially futons. Especially heavy-ass futons. Those yeah. are human-sized Venus flytraps. Yeah, because it's heavily implied that she might have even been crushed to death, you know? Ow. Either crushed or suffocated, but either way, it's not a pretty way to go. No, 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 no. Matter no, no. So, I think here at one oh seven thirty, we'll call 40. it. Yeah, we'll call it one oh seven forty. All right, we're out of spoiler territory, so uh, I guess just time for the usual wrap up and closing thoughts. So, uh, Richie, what are your closing thoughts? House is an absolute nightmare. The good kind. Please watch it. I feel like my unstable ramblings are not doing this justice. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that I won't know what my detailed thoughts are until after this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, overall for me, if you want a film with an excellent late 70s Japanese score, uh, that act, that like captures like the feeling of the weird disconnect disjointed nature of dreams especially the childish ones you have with like irrational fears this is such a perfect film to check out and it's got something you'll probably be engaged by i would also say definitely check out this film um with the because it's a perfect amalgamation of horror and a little bit of comedy and just surrealist oddball weirdness that I enjoy in certain films um we already mentioned how this film is like an amalgamation of childhood fears cause he asked his cause the director asked his daughter what are you afraid of or like what are things that freak you out 
and that's how the movie dreams kinda, you've had, yeah. or like yeah. what are some nightmares you've had and I feel like this just perfectly puts it all together um the only thing I can say is if it gets kind of there are some scenes that get kind of weird but the entire movie is a weird movie so take what you can get <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but before we get into the closing, closing, we have to talk to you about the future because. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, are you a fan of this podcast? Would you like to finally meet us in person? Well, boy, oh, howdy, do we have good news for you. At the next upcoming Monster Mania in Oaks, PA in November from the. 11th to the 13th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Yep, in Oaks. We will be there uh, at the Witch and Crafts booth. We will be selling some convention-exclusive Killer Score merch. Some of our, well, our first merch you can buy. And you can stop by and talk to us. We got bags. We got stickers. We got pins. Yep. And we're planning on eventually in the future making some more products. We want to eventually bring you t-shirts, beanies, and stuff similar to that. Maybe you, even coffee mugs. Yeah. You like that logo that I put together for this wonderful podcast? Well, you're going to see a whole lot of it. We got it on pins, totes, and uh, stickers. Stickers. So, um, we also, around this time of year, you know, like to do fundraisers. So, this year's fundraiser is for the Animal Welfare Association in Voorhees. Mm -hmm. They are a charity organization. They're an animal shelter, low-cost vet clinic, and spay and neuter clinic. They help um, dogs, cats, and small furry friends like rabbits, chinchillas, gerbils, guinea pigs. Uh, They help them find homes. Um, as we also met, as I just mentioned, they also have a low cost spay and neuter, spay, neuter and vet clinic, um, where they do anything from like emergency visits to also general care, like vaccinations, mm-hmm. um, general checkups for your pets. And Dalton and I have gotten our cats from the AWA, the Animal Welfare Association. We our current fur babies, Bowie and Chimney, are both from there. Yep. We got them as kittens, and they're our fur babies. They're been they're they're just they're great animals. The AWA does great work, and my grandmother, after her uh, cat passed away a few years ago, she got a lovely cat from the AWA as well, a year old cat, who has just been a sweet boy and just been lovely, gentle, playful, and just everything you could want out of a cat. Uh, we love the AWA, and we'd love to give back to them, so we are going to be starting a fundraiser for the AWA in uh, November. Yes, November 1st is the day we start the fundraiser. We will also have a donation jar at the Monster Mania 52 at Oaks, PA. Um, so anyone who wants to donate a dollar, even some change of what they have, all, the, all that money goes from the donation jar, from the GoFundMe, um, from any donations that come in, will go directly to the AWA. We'll be doing a mix of monetary donations and supplies, things like pet food, cat litter, Mm -hmm. toys, towels, bedding, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Anything a little kitty could ever need. Or doggy. Or doggy, or rabbit, or gerbil, what have you, could ever want. You know, even a snake if they did snakes, but they don't do snakes. Who knows? Maybe a snake would like a little hat. I don't know. <laughs> hey, uh, Brittany, if you're listening, who knows? Maybe uh, some of that money will go towards your uh, rat babies. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what our fundraiser is going to be, and that's what we have going on in the future. But uh, fall's going to be ending in a few weeks. Mm-hmm. We've got like the colder seasons coming up, which means we'll be shifting gears here again at Killer Score. So uh, next will be Richie, unless we have a guest episode come up. Who knows? So uh, what do you got in mind, buddy? Well, you had mentioned before that I'm very much the lighting nerd. True. And if there is one type of movie that I like, it's one that captures the 
dark intensity of a long drive home. Get what I said there? I said drive. Oh. Okay. Yes, indeed. Next time on Killer Score, I would very much love my pick to be the Michael Mann-ish neo-noir crime drama Drive, starring the unmistakable Ryan Gosling. I'm a big Nicholas Winding Refn fan and a big fan of that film, so I cannot wait to share it for us to get into that. Yep. After that hiatus, we're bringing it into November with Drive. See you then.